As I bring this series to a close today, let me sum up everything that we have been talking about in probably three simple statements. I'll try to sum it up in three simple statements and maybe add one or two thoughts together, trusting that uh, it will build us up and edify us. All right? So, as I bring this series to a closure, let me sum up everything by saying this. One, first, the greatest focus in building representation is relationship. The greatest focus in building representation is relationship, your relationship with God. You want to build a stature that represents God. You want to have a representation of God that is accurate, exact, meaningful, impactful in life, then zero in on this thing called relationship. Focus on, build upon, seek, pursue a relationship with God. If there is only one thing you will do, let that be the thing. Let that be the thing. Like someone said, Henry Blackaby, says the key to success is not method, but relationship. Relationship is the top button. You get it wrong, every other button will be wrong. That's the beginning point. As a matter of fact, for you to have a dominion on earth, you also need horizontal relationships. Very key. I wish we can understand the place of relationships, both vertical relationship with God and horizontal relationships with one another. And let me say this, dominion is not uh, through just any relationship, but meaningful, life-giving relationships. Okay? Meaningful and life-giving relationships. If you are able to come to a place where you can pursue and have covenantal relationships, then that is the better. But I want you to pursue relationships seriously in this dominion mandate. But for our case, building representation, which is representing God, the one thing to focus on is relationship. That's how Jesus functioned. Jesus functioned in a living, honorable, intimate, and unbroken relationship with the Father. A living, living, very, very important. Not just any relationship, but it's a living relationship, honorable, intimate, and unbroken. This relationship with God is not a religious relationship, it's a living relationship, okay? It is an honorable relationship. It is an intimate relationship and an unbroken relationship. It is always continuous, unbroken relationship with the Father, okay? Relationship with the Father. That's very, very important for us to understand. So this is what you have to pursue irrespective of where you are, irrespective of what you are facing or what you are going through, this is what you are to pursue relentlessly, tirelessly, a living, honorable, intimate, and unbroken relationship with the Heavenly Father. Are we together? A living, you want to say with me, a living, a living. Honorable, honorable, intimate, intimate. And, unbroken. and unbroken. Your relationship with God has to be what? Living, number one, isn't it? It's a living relationship. Life is flowing. It's not something religious. Forget about religion. It's a living relationship. It has divine life. It's dynamic. It's energetic. It's living. Secondly, it's honorable. Everyone say honorable. honorable. It has to be what? Honorable. honorable. That means what? This relationship, you treat it with honor. You treat yourself with honor. Are we together? We are in a very honorable relationship. So I treat the other party with honor. The other party treats me with honor. And for the sake of the other party, and for the sake of this relationship, I carry myself with honor. honor. 
That's why you must have honorable thoughts. Talk to me, somebody. Have honorable thoughts. An honorable plan. Honorable pursuits. Honorable ideas. Honorable agendas. You must dress honorably. You must speak honorably. Now listen. Dressing honorably is not dressing expensively. Don't mistake the two. Because you can, you can dress honorably but not expensively. Those, those two are not related. And expensive does not always mean honorable. They dress honorably. In a way that as you walk among people, God is not dishonored. That's what I'm talking about. Because you have a relationship with Him. Talk to me somebody. It's an honorable relationship. You can see how much it will shape your life. Alright? It's very what? Honorable. Thirdly, it's what? Intimate. It's a very intimate relationship. Very intimate. Where you have given Him your heart and you have His heart. When you talk about intimacy, we come to the matters of the heart. We come to the matters of exchange of life. We come to the point of openness. We're together. We come to the point of openness. It's very intimate. There's no reservation. By the time we talk about intimacy, it simply means I've given you my all. I've opened up my all. You have access to me. I have access to you. We are intimate. There's nothing to hide. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Intimate relationship. And then lastly, it must be unbroken. Now that's where the work is unbroken it must not be interfered with either by lack or by poverty either by pain by pain or by plenty or by pleasure are we together it must not be interfered with okay it must not be interfered with so are we together so that's what you're to pursue that's what you're to pursue this is the greatest focus okay the greatest focus in, in building representation is relationship. Your relationship with God. This relationship has got to be a what? A living, honorable, intimate, and unbroken. It must not be broken. Are you together? It must not be broken. By pain, by lack, by needs, by plenty, by desires. And let me tell you this today. Right from Genesis chapter number 3. What the enemy has been, was, is, and has always been after is your relationship with God. It's nothing else. The enemy was not after the garden of Eden. Satan was not after the garden of Eden. Satan was not even after the man himself. No. Satan was after the relationship between God and man to have it broken. Now right from there, throughout the Bible is a story of a people turning away from God and God calling them back to himself. A people returning to God and experiencing God's grace, goodness, mercy, and favor. And then at the point, at the, at the, at the place of, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, plenty. At the point of plenty, then they turn away from God. You see that? So the, the relationship is broken because of their plenty, prosperity. They are so prosperous. They turn away. Then they are judged. They are beaten up. They are condemned. They are everything else. They cry to God. They return to God. He restores them. They begin to experience His goodness, to enjoy His goodness, His mercy, His kindness, everything about Him. Are we together? Yes. So He does not give them these things. Now, get my language. He does not give them these things. They just come back to Him. They come back to Him. By coming back to Him, they become beneficiaries of His goodness, of His kindness, of His mercy. Of his blessing. He had not denied them these things. They turned away from him. They come back to him. They partake of what is his nature. Can I hear an amen? amen? That's the whole thing. So the whole thing is a story. The whole Bible is a story of God calling man back to a place of intimacy with him. A place of unbroken relationship with him. If you understand that, it will shift and you know it will shift your mind completely. Cross over to the New Testament. Same thing again. It's God calling man. And then God decides now, in the Old Testament, I made, a, I made, I made requirements for man to accomplish, man to attain to, so that we can have a relationship. Man has not been able to do that. So I'm going to make it possible 
for man to reach me without doing anything. Only all he requires is to believe what I have done. All right? So while man was to pay the price and sacrifice to reach to the Father, now in the New Testament, again, by the same purpose. But in this case here, the Father pays the price. Can I hear an amen? amen? He pays the price that will satisfy him. He becomes the sacrifice because only God can please God. So God sacrifices God so that man can have God and man can come back to God. And the ultimate sacrifice that God made was God. Come on now. Yeah. And so why that? That man can come back to God and have a relationship with him. So what is God seeking for? An unbroken relationship with man. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. What is the enemy after? The same relationship. To have a, it broken. While father wants it unbroken, the enemy wants it broken. So you've got to make a choice. Now, how, this is how it works. When you purpose to remain in him in an unbroken relationship, the Holy Spirit strengthens you. The Holy Spirit energizes you. When you make a decision that is contrary to this thing, then the Holy Spirit backs up. He cannot help you in that. But when you decide, I want to remain connected and I want to remain constant in God, the Holy Spirit helps you. He energizes you. He strengthens you. He edifies you. He shows you. He teaches you. He helps you to enjoy an unbroken relationship with the Father. Amen? Amen. So this is the relationship you are to pursue. What kind of a relationship? Talk to me, somebody. A living, yes. An honorable, yes. An intimate, yes. And unbroken. It must be living. So that life must keep flowing. It must be honorable. So you have to honor him. And you have to honor yourself. And you have to honor the relationship. Carry yourself with honor, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you. You never rise to influence, to dignity, to prominence, to power. You never rise to authority. You never rise to influence if you don't honor yourself. You don't carry yourself with honor. You must learn to carry yourself with honor. At your level. Let me tell you this. Different levels have different demands of honor. Different levels have different honor. Every level has its honor. Every level has its glory. So you keep the honor at your level and at your glory. And the glory at your level rather. You hear me friends? Yeah. You must do that. You must do that. Carry yourself honorably. Learn to speak honorably. Learn to think honorable thoughts. Behave honorably. Behave honorably. Why? You, have an, you are in a very honorable relationship. If you understand that, and this is one thing that is lacking in the church today, honor. This lacks in the church. We are lacking honor in the church. We don't honor one another. Let me begin here. We don't honor the Father. We don't honor ourselves. We don't honor one another. We are just careless and casual. Careless and casual. And speaking a few tongues. Listen, and I'm going to say this boldly here. There are doors that your tongues will not open, but honor will open. And there are doors that tongues will open, but it will take honor to walk through them. We're together. How many have you been in a place where you can see that door is open, but you know very well you cannot walk through that door? But it's open, but you can't walk through. Because you don't have the stature to walk through that door. You are not the kind that is walking through that door. And they say, this door, this, and these kind of people will pass through this door. The rest of us, uh, we, we have the compound. So the door is open, isn't it? But there is a level of honor you have to carry to walk through that door. Are we together? Yes. Yeah. So don't just look for open doors. You've got to know how to walk through those open doors. We just, we, I like the way we preach and stop at the point of open doors. Many people right now are standing before open doors, staring at open doors, but you can't walk through. You don't have the stature. You don't have the honor to walk through that door. You are not permitted to walk through that door. It's open, but you should not walk through because you don't have the stature. You can't handle it. What happens is when you push through that door, you know what happens in. Just go back to the Bible and find the story Jesus gave. 
where a man walked in and he was in the party and the master was walking through and found the man and asked him, how did you get in here? Is that in your Bible? Yes. My friend, Jesus can ask you, how did you get? Yeah. Because it's not your level. There's an honor your possession deserves. Can I hear an amen? amen? Yeah. Look at your neighbor, tell them there's an honor that my position as a son of God demands. Yeah. That's how you can't behave. That's how you cannot behave, ladies and gentlemen. There is a way you cannot behave because you're a son of God. And listen to me. Because you are in an honorable relationship with the Father. Say after me, everybody. My relationship with God, relationship with God is a very honorable relationship. A very honorable relationship. You didn't say that meaning. Do you believe it? After me again. My relationship with God is a very honorable relationship. It's a very honorable relationship. Did you believe it? Yes. That would, it dictates that you have to be careful. Before you get out of the house, think about it. As you handle your children, think about it. Are you talking to your children in an honorable way? Are you talking to your husband and wife in an honorable way? How do you behave in the moment of pain? If there is a moment we behave dishonorably, it's when we are in pain or plenty or pleasure. Whether in pleasure, in plenty, or in pain, we must be conscious of this honorable relationship. Oh, yes. So this is how Jesus functioned. This is how Noah functioned. This is how Abraham functioned. Very meaningful relationship. This is how Moses functioned. Who doesn't know that Moses was close with God? Relationship. This is how David functioned. I'm telling you. This is how Daniel functioned. Indeed, indeed, Daniel is referred to as the beloved of the Lord. Daniel. Such a relationship. This is how Peter functioned. All we know is that Peter was sinking. And then after Peter trying to sink, the second thing we know is that Peter denied Jesus three times. Then we go on and demonize Peter. Not, not realizing that among the people that were, that were consulted and brought stability when Paul's ministry was causing chaos was Peter. Among the people the church referred to was Peter. Now you tell us, how do you handle the Gentiles matter? When Peter spoke, then James had wisdom to deliver judgment. We think about Christ and then Paul. It should be Christ and then Peter and then Paul. Now let's not go theology there. But let's let's be let's let's not let's not deny that man his place. Must look at what Christ said, then go to Petra in letters, then go to Pauline letters. And you see the mind of Christ. This is how Paul functioned. A living, honorable, intimate and unbroken relationship with the Father. This is how you and I are designed to function. This is how you and I are expected to function. You are expected to function from this position of a living, honorable, intimate, and unbroken relationship with the Father. Amen? Amen. That's the first thing. The greatest focus in building representation is what? A genuine, intimate relationship with God is critical in your deputizing and representation mandate. And so, beloved, as you journey in Christ and increase in the knowledge of God and His will, as you get more intimate with the Father, as you love Him more and obey His word to you, you are building representation. You are positioning yourself to be an accurate expression and representation of Christ. Amen? So I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, I urge you in the Lord. I urge you in the Lord. Beloved, above everything else, pursue a selfless and intimate relationship with God, your heavenly Father. That's how you build? That's how you build what? Representation. Become a God-centered person. We're together. Become a God-centered person. 
Become God-centered in your thinking and action. God-centered. Become God-centered in your thinking and action. Let God continually reveal himself to you and through you because that is a key to success. Become God-centered. So pursue relationships. Secondly, secondly, as you position ourselves to effectively represent Christ wherever we are in whatever circumstances we are in, we need to access from God divine power and wisdom. I said I want to give you three, try to give you, to sum up this whole thing we'll be sharing in three uh, points here uh, as I close this session today or uh, this lesson today. So first, the greatest focus in building representation is relationship. That's your relationship with God. Secondly, we need to access from God divine power and wisdom. So as we position ourselves to effectively represent Christ wherever we are and in whatever circumstances we are in, we need to access from God what? Divine power and wisdom. wisdom. That's what the Bible will call the former and the latter reign. Joel chapter 2, let's read it together. Joel chapter number 2, verse 23. Joel 2, 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. He will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The former and the latter. The former and the latter together. What a powerful thing it will be. What a rain that will fall. The former and cross over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 24. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. The Jews a stumbling block and the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Some seek for a sign, others seek for wisdom. You see, in the previous moves that were there, what we saw was demonstration of power. The emphasis was power. The language was power. Receive the power. Receive the what? Power. We talked about power. We sought power. We prayed about power. We preached about power. We demonstrated power. Now that's only one side of the, of the coin. Amen. The other side is wisdom. In this season, what God has been bringing in is what? Wisdom. Are we together? Wisdom. The right application of knowledge. That's why there's been a lot of knowledge in this apostolic season. A lot of revelation knowledge. Understanding of the word. It is God bringing the wisdom. But listen now. For you to come to the place where you are a good expression of the Father, where you have the capacity to rule and reign on His behalf and in His name, you are building representation, you need both power and wisdom. Can I hear an amen? amen. For many years, the different moves talk of the, uh, the faith movement, talk of the Pentecostal movement, talk of the charismatic movement, but right from the faith, from the Pentecostal, the charismatic, and all these things, the emphasis has been power. Power. During the Pentecostal season, we talked a lot, you shall receive power. Now, when the, when the apostolic season began, about 20 years now on earth, I tell you, God can be doing something and you don't know. You can be absent. The season we are propagating has been advancing, has been on earth for the last 20 plus years. Over 20 years now, the apostolic season. Right? Some of us have had about it just about three years ago, two years ago, one year ago. Others are wondering, oh, there's something new. 
So God is, yeah. So God can be working and you don't know. And that, that to me is a very serious thing, isn't it? Yes. So listen. Listen. When the, when the apostolic season began, and, and a lot of uh, accurate understanding and the presence of scriptures was coming through, what was God bringing forth? Wisdom. Are we together? The wisdom that comes from the word, revealing Christ as the wisdom. Now, where we are in, and what we are coming into, is where God is beginning to marry the two, and begin to reveal Christ in his fullness, as both the power and the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. We begin to understand, and that's why in the apostolic season, Jesus Christ was emphasized as a central theme. All right? In this season, the centrality of Christ has been an emphasis. We begin to understand that God's power is a person. Praise the Lord. God's power is? Come on now. God's power is? God's wisdom is? God's way is? God's truth is? God's life is? That person is Jesus Christ. That's why you must bring Jesus at the center of your life. Because when Jesus takes the center place in your life, suddenly you begin to access the wisdom of God, the power of God, the glory of God, the, the grace of God. Remember, he is the embodiment of the grace. And guess what? He is the image of God. Begin to access the image of God, this person, Jesus. And so if we will build this capacity, to be an exact representation of God, ladies and gentlemen, we have to access both power and wisdom that is converged in Christ. Now, I'll give you wisdom. I'm going to say the second, but let me call it wisdom. I'll give you wisdom. Can I? If power becomes your priority, you can miss out wisdom. But if wisdom becomes a priority, wisdom leads to power. Wisdom will make you powerful. But power will not make you wise. That's why you can be in power, even in the natural. You can come to a place of power, but you have no wisdom. But even in the natural, when you have wisdom, you have power. So let's seek wisdom, isn't it? Yeah. But let's desire to have the balance of both. That is very, it's going to be very key in the time we are coming in. Time we are coming in. Time we are coming in. The warfare, the battle has changed. In the Old Testament, they fought giants, Goliath, men, physical things. Isn't it? Whatever. Now we are not fighting those Goliaths. It's shifted in the spirit. If you don't have wisdom that is heavenly, you cannot handle, and power that is heavenly, you cannot handle the battle of the day. Lastly, to become an exact representation of God in our spheres, we have to learn to function from heaven while on earth. We have to learn to function from heaven while on earth. We call that living a heavenly life. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we are so privileged that in Christ, and I wanted to get me clear here, we are so privileged that in Christ, we have access to the two realms of life. The visible and the invisible. The physical and the spiritual. In Christ. In Christ, we have access to heaven and earth. So listen. You don't have to come out of your body to access the spirit realm. What do you call that? In demonic world. Tran. Trans, is it called transcendental something? something. Trans, where, yeah, I think transcendental meditation, where they try to get 
they, they, they help you, but you have to, to account to a particular place in the spirit and in their ranking that you are able to leave the body to access the spirit realm. Very demonic thing to do. And leave your body. But in Christ, we don't leave the body. We have access to both heaven and earth at the same time. Can you believe it? So privileged in Christ. So privileged. So privileged. That's why he says, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. So how does that happen? The laying hands on the sick, that's a physical. That's a physical touch. Sickness is something invisible. What you see are simply manifestations of the sickness. You don't see sickness. Mm -hmm. You don't see sickness. What you see are manifestations of the sickness. That's why you go and tell the doctor you are sick. They ask you, what are the symptoms? What are you feeling? Then you tell them the symptoms, the manifestations of the sickness. That they go and try to, you know, do some tests to write the, using the symptoms to see what name they have for the sickness that you are suffering. And so they tell the name of that sickness which they cannot see. So sickness is not visible. You don't see sickness, you see symptoms. That's why we lay hands on you. That's a physical thing that we do to the physical body where the symptoms are manifesting. Then we speak a word and access the spirit realm where the sickness is coming from and it's subdued in the spirit and the physical body is set free. How do you explain that? It's a supernatural thing. I did not have to come out of the body. Yet I access the spirit. You see that? So I think those are mysteries now you have to come to. That's a very high level of understanding that you think about there. Where you begin to understand that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Amen. Seated with Christ. Where you understand that you are reigning in life. But you see, unless you develop this consciousness, it becomes... Let me not say that one. It's just a verse in the Bible that you read. It's a consciousness you must develop that I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places. I sit in a place of majesty. I sit in a place of authority and influence, a place of dignity and authority, a place of glory in Christ. Begin to, begin to understand that you are seated at the right hand. Now those are things when we say, people think we are cultic or we are going too far. But it's in the Bible. That we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. In fact, it says this in Colossians 3. Seated with Christ. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. So where, if our life is hidden with Christ in God, where is my life? In God. So you want to access me? Then you have to access God. Dissect him. Remove me from there. But that's something you must believe. That, now that beats logic. That beats logic. As I'm telling you, we, we, we are far from understanding these realities and begin to leave them. But when they become realities, my friend, you have no idea the dominion we are going to, being to, we are going to begin to see on earth. These are realities we have seen and I'm praying, Lord, help me. I want to, I want to access that truth. That I have a consciousness that I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Look at how we use energy and forming and crying and shouting, trying to cast out one demon out of one small girl. And we gather seven able-bodied men to try to deal with one small demon and one small girl. One hour down the line, we are still struggling there. It's because we are trying to come back, you see. It's because we are trying to handle these things with the arm of flesh. But if someone rises and understands where I sit, that understanding alone is authority. And the devils know. Paul, I am Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But you. Blessed be the name of the living God. Amen. Go to learn to function from heaven. Jesus said in John chapter 3, 
and verse 10. John 3, 10 to 13. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? He's talking to Nicodemus. Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. John 3, 10 to 13. Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive a witness. Verse 12. If you, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So it means there are earthly things and there are heavenly things. You know, Jesus, I mean, we are Judas to enter the kingdom must be born again. To Jesus, that is earthly. It's very normal, very, very simple. Judas, not Judas, or Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a teacher. Nicodemus was what you'd call today a doctor in theology. We're together. He was a, doc, a renowned doctor in theology. Nicodemus is a philosopher. He can't understand he must be born again. Then he asks, how do I get into my mother's womb? Jesus said, this is an earthly thing. Then he says, the wind, you hear the wind blowing, but you cannot tell where it is coming from and where it is going. That's how the spiritual man is. The man is so confused. Jesus tells him, now, how do I explain this to you now? Earthly things you're not getting. How do I explain to you spiritual, heavenly things? I'll tell you here today. If we preach, if we teach you people and preach to you people the, the heavenly aspect of a simple principle that like tithing, that one alone, the heavenly aspect of that, you, you pick up stones possibly. Yeah. So he says, what do I do? Then he goes on to say, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. In heaven. He's talking to Judah, to, to Nicodemus, one on one. You see, you see, no one has ever ascended to heaven. No one, no one has been. No one. Except son the son of man. Who is in heaven. in heaven. But I thought we are talking here. What's going on here? He complicates the matters for Nicodemus. Nicodemus, as I talk with you here now, I'm in heaven. So I'm both here and there. Talking to the son of man. But I'm also a son of God. Hallelujah. Listen, we have to come to that place where even us, we can't understand when we are son of man and son of God. We are so wrapped up in God, ladies and gentlemen, that you cannot even tell when you're operating as a son of God or son of man because you're just speaking life. You're just speaking wisdom. Hallelujah. Whether in a social gathering, whether you are casual, whether you're talking politics, whatever you are talking, you also cannot tell whether it's coming from heaven or from earth. Because you just say it comes to pass. Then you wonder, oh. So that one, when I was talking, was from heaven. I thought we were just talking politics. So learning to operate where? Heaven. Function from heaven while on earth. Heaven and earth, listen to me. Heaven and earth converge in Jesus. Can I hear an Amen. Heaven and earth converting. So he is in heaven and on earth. Meaning what, ladies and gentlemen? If you remain in him, meet with him, then you have access to heaven and to earth. The spirit is heavenly. The soul is earthly. As it were. God made man in heaven. Then he picked the earth, soil, earth. Made a body for the man. Breathed into man, he became a living soul. But he has the spirit which is of God, which is divine. In Christ, you have access to what is divine. 
what is heavenly. That's why God has the audacity of telling us to pray that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth. How? As it is in heaven. Because he knows it is possible for what is in heaven to be done on earth. Why? Because he has someone on earth who can access heaven. He knows it. He knows it. He says, shall I hide this secret from my servant Abraham? Shall I hide the secret from? Because there are secrets in heaven. But to a son, they are not secrets. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Jesus is born. He's less than 33 years. And he tells the Jews, before Abraham was, I am. That's the son of man talking. They don't understand now at this point. They are, seeing the son, they are looking at the son of man, but it's the son of God talking. Before Abraham was, I am. I am. We must come there where we can, even us, we can't explain. But we are just lost in him. Can I hear an amen? amen? That's how you become a son who is an exact representation of his father. Look at 1 Corinthians as we begin to wind up. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47 to 49. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47 to 49. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so, are, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, the first man is Adam. The second man is Christ. We're together. It's Jesus. Now we bear the, uh, uh, the dust. <clears throat> Alright? As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. That's the physical aspect of our lives. As the heavenly man, so also those who are heavenly. That is the redeemed man. That's the redeemed man. So we have both the earthly aspect and the heavenly aspect. The natural and the supernatural. Are we together? Yeah. As we have borne the image of the man of the dust, that's Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, that's Jesus. Now, in Christ, we have that image. Can I hear an amen? amen? So when he comes in us, we have access to heaven while we are on earth. Now, if we yield to him fully, ladies and gentlemen, it is possible for us to live a heavenly life while on earth. It is possible. All that heaven will become a reality in our day. Amen. This heavenly man is a mature son in Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen? This heavenly man, this man who is living a heavenly life, this man who is doing the will that is heaven on earth, this man that is functioning from heaven while on earth, this heavenly man, is a mature son in Christ through whom the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. It's a mature son through whom the father is revealed. That's a very high level of maturity and I pray that we will come there. So make it your personal goal, make it your personal desire and commitment to mature in every way in Christ. Amen? Amen. Find your position. Get deep in Christ. Get stable in Christ. Allow me to close and wrap up this lesson by reading for us Colossians 2, 6 to 10. Colossians 2, 6 to 10. And I'll just make a comment on verse number 7. I'm so happy that this lesson is coming to a close today. I know, I know I'm forcing it to end, but uh, it's because um, that's, that's what is in my heart. Colossians 2, 6 to 10 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
And you are complete in him, Christ, who is the head of all principality and power. Hallelujah. Amen. What a joyful thing to know. Rooted in Christ. That talks of depth. Okay? Rooted in Christ. That talks of de depth. We must be rooted, fixed, grounded in him. In Christ. That's how it becomes stable. You cannot represent him if you're not rooted in him. Secondly, it says, built up in Christ. Built up in Christ. In Christ. Okay? That talks of uh, position. Positioned. Rightly positioned. Erected. To build there uh, is a word, epochodomio, uh, which has got to do with to build upright. Eh? To erect upright. So it, it has got to do with to position. So being positioned rightly in Christ. So one is taking root, the other one is being positioning. One is in the invisible, the other one is in the visible. One is internal, rooted, the other one is external, built up. Are we together? We cannot talk about how you get built up there. There are many things you could have said. And lastly, it says what? Established in Christ. That talks of stability. Established in Christ. That is what? Stability. Stability. That which holds family, that which is stable, that which is prospering, that which is excelling. A very powerful thing there, ladies and gentlemen. So whatever happens, I encourage you. Be rooted in Christ. Be built up in Christ. And establish may you be established in Christ. Okay? Yeah. Built up. Rooted in, built up, and established. To be rooted is to deepen our understanding and scope. To be rooted is to touch the core of the truth. So don't just learn the truth, but touch the core. Isn't it? Deepen your understanding. How deep do you get in the core? It's very, very Important. Very important. You have to be built up also. Okay? And uh, to be built up talks of being upright. To be built up talks of character. Developing a character. To be built up talks of maturity. You are developing in maturity in Christ. You are progressing through the stages of development. Isn't it? To be established uh, means what? Stability, rest, means you're holding family. You've been brought to stability in Christ. Your family in Christ. So be firm. Be rooted. Be stable. I conclude by saying, make it your daily desire and commitment to conform to Christ. That's how you build representation. Can I hear an amen? Amen. If you have received Christ, so walk in Him. May you go forth there and become an exact <coughs> expression, representation of Christ. Let your life reveal Him. Let your life manifest Him. Pursue that relationship with Him. Access power and wisdom in Him. Walk in this wisdom. Don't, don't, don't walk like a fool on earth. Walk in wisdom. Walk in power. Don't walk in weakness. But walk in power. And lastly, learn to function from a heavenly position. Learn to function from heaven while you are on earth. Lastly, be firm. Let's be rooted. Develop a Christ-like character. Be built up. And may you flourish wherever you are. Be established in life. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among the sanctified. God bless you. Amen.